So Stefania, please confirm if you can see my, see my uh, presentation. Absolutely, yes. Okay, so before we kickstart the formal training and dive deep into the methodology of SDG 241 and start disentangling its intricacies step by step, in this very first presentation, I will give you a bird eye view of the SDG indicator under FAO mandate, particularly highlighting the progress that we have made until so far, both on the methodological and capacity development fronts. During the course of the presentation, I will also let you know about our future plans for capacity development, that is technical assistance and training of the country officials and respective institutions, and support to data collection and reporting efforts by the countries to facilitate the global and regional monitoring of the SDG indicators under our custodianship. So the learning objectives uh, for this session are, um, I will introduce you to the SDG indicator of under FAO mandate, walk you through the work undertaken by FAO so far on SDGs, as I mentioned, both on the methodological capacity development and support to data collection and reporting. Uh, I will provide you with the necessary means and ways that is links to the websites, etc., where you can find information on the FAO SDGs. And lastly, to introduce you to our potential future lines of work that will maximize data reporting on the, on, on the SDGs. So let me start by giving you an our arching or holistic overview of the global indicator framework and the process adopted by United Nations for putting in place at the national, region, and global level. The global indicator framework comprises of 231 unique indicators and was endorsed by the United Nations General Assembly in July 2017. Uh, now, in order to oversee and manage this process, um, United Nations Statistical Commission was made responsible for development and impl implementation of SDG monitoring framework. And in addition, an interagency and expert group on sustainable development goals, that is IAEG SDG, was constituted to prepare initial proposals on the methodology and to oversee this work until 2030. Now, the IAEG SDG has 28. Uh, countries as members representing their respective region. An important point to note is that the process with IAEG SDG has been fully led by countries with international organizations like FAO only serving as observers. On top of this, for each SDG indicator, a custodian uh, UN agency was identified and was assigned the following uh, responsibilities. First one to lead methodological development and documentation of the indicators. Second one to support statistical capacity of the countries to generate and disseminate national data. Third one to collect data from national sources, ensure its comparability and consistency and disseminate it uh, at a global level. And lastly, to contribute to monitoring the progress at the global, regional, and national levels. Uh, for example, storylines and data for annual SDG reports or agency flagship uh, publications. Now, the global indicators are a core set of matrices that all countries are invited to monitor. The key point to remember is if national data are not produced, regional and global indicators cannot be produced. Another important point to be noted is that the global indicators can be complemented, but not replaced. And this is very important. So it can be complemented, but not replaced with national or regional indicators. This is as, paragraph, uh, as per paragraph 75 of the United Nations resolution on the 2030 agenda. And lastly, global monitoring is based on data produced by the countries with NSOs having a key coordinating role at the national level. So even if the estimates for the indicators are produced by international organizations, prior consultation or validation and its triangulation is needed with countries before, before its, uh, uh, its publication. We as FAO, a custodian a United Nations agency for 21 SDG indicators and a contributing agency for five others, primarily related to food and agriculture space. Uh, in this capacity, uh, us as FAO 
uh, is supporting countries' efforts in monitoring the 2030 agenda. The 21 SDG indicators are spread across the following six goals that include goal two, food security, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture. Goal five on gender equality. Goal six on use of water. Goal 12 on sustainable consumption and production. Goal 14 on oceans and goal 15 on life on land. Now, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, FAO key areas of work on SDG indicator involve methodological development, statistical capacity development, global data collection and dissemination, global progress report and voluntary review submitted by the countries to FAO. And lastly, the communication and advocacy part of the SDG uh, indicators. In terms of uh, FAO work on SDG indicators, uh, back in 2015, of the 21 SDG indicators that we are custodian agency for, 13 were tier three indicators, which means that neither international methodology nor data existed on these uh, indicators. This meant that FAO had to develop new methodological proposals in consultation with countries and compile it with the IAEG SDG criteria for tier three reclassification. This was the case for numerous indicators, which uh, I'm not gonna go to, through the list, but just to exemplify, 231, uh, 232, 241, and so on. For some SDG indicators, uh, FAO also had to develop new international definitions uh, for the key concepts. This was the case with indicator 231 and 232, whereby we came up with a definition of small scale food producers and the definition of rural and urban areas, which is still under the process of uh, development. And once developed, it's gonna be used for disaggregation of many SDGs that goes beyond the mandate of, uh, of FAO. The work, of course, didn't stop at the methodological development stage, but continued at fast pace, where in addition for all indicators under our custodianship, we develop improved data collection tools, guidelines, and supporting uh, documents and materials to facilitate countries reporting on the newly developed, approved, and endorsed methodologies. Now, this slide summarizes the tier status of the 21 SDG indicators with red being tier three, which I already mentioned, nor methodology, neither the data existed. Yellow uh, tier two, uh, for which methodology exists, but no data collection is available. And tier three uh, and, and green tier one, which means that both methodology and uh, data uh, exist and is regularly reported by the countries to FAO. Now, as of November, 2015, 13 indicators were tier three, five were uh, tier two, and only uh, three were tier one. Meaning a lot of our work back then was focused on methodological development of the indicators. Hence, given the intensity of the work involved, we as FAO realigned our work programs both strategically and operationally to support the methodological development of the tier three indicators. Um, with the four years of steadfast technical work of cross-functional teams responsible for respective SDGs at FAO headquarters, while leveraging a participatory, a consultative and inclusive process, and most importantly, with support from officials like yourself and experts from countries, international organizations, private sector, and academia, we were able to establish methodological basis for all the remaining tier three indicators. As you may see in the matrix uh, as of now, currently none of the indicator remain as, uh, as tier three. In parallel with the methodological development, lots of efforts were targeted to support countries to enable them start adopting, implementing, and reporting data on the 21 SDG indicators. This included, included testing the methodologies in selected countries for finalizing uh, the methodological proposals, development of e-learning courses, organization of country, regional, and global training workshops to build statistical capacity of the countries, and development of a comprehensive SDG data and communication portal 
that serve as a one-stop shop for all information on the 21 SDG indicators. Of course, um, uh, our new vision uh, of FAO for 2019 and 2030 is to scale up capacity development at a country level to maximize uh, country reporting on, on, on the 21 SDGs. Um, now, in terms of the training workshop that I just spoke about on the previous slide, the very aim of this exercise uh, was including this very virtual training that is progressing now uh, has been to enlarge the pool of SDG monitoring experts at the country level, facilitate South-South cooperation amongst the country, especially developing ones, uh, and to facilitate the testing of the new methods that were developed uh, earlier in the process. In total, until so far, we have conducted 50 plus training workshops between 2017 and 2020 that were participated uh, by experts from uh, 150 plus countries belonging to different regions of the world. The ultimate focus was obviously to increase the number of data points that is the number of uh, reporting countries. Now, as I've mentioned, uh, we have developed e-learning courses for uh, most of the SDGs that we are custodian agency for. These uh, e-learning courses have been published and available freely online uh, on FAO SDG page, uh, which I would provide you the link to. You can go there and take these courses at your own convenience um, to, to, to familiarize yourself with the, with the methodology of uh, methodologies of these SDG indicators. Here are some more uh, online courses that we have developed. And there are a few indicators for which we are still in process of developing e-learning courses and these will be available soon. One of the key feature of these uh, e-learning courses, of course, is once you take these courses, you will be awarded um, a course completion certificate. So all the information on the e-learning courses, as you can see in the bottom, uh, of course, we will share all these presentations with you after the training workshop. So you can click there and you, know, you can access these online courses on the SDGs. And mind you, apart from the SDG indicators, there are many other subjects or disciplines for which we have developed uh, uh, these uh, e-learning courses. So it is a very good resources for building capacities uh, uh, of the country staff. Going forward at FAO, uh, we will continue to work closely in collaboration with our member states to pursue and implement our future activities, particularly from capacity development perspective. That includes, uh, first, further work on different methodological aspects of the indicators and its testing, that is data disaggregation techniques, forecasting, now casting, and small area estimation to facilitate reporting on the SDG. Secondly, to carry out data gap assessment at a national level and to further strengthen engagement with the national stakeholders, particularly on the alignment of national and regional indicators frameworks with, with SDG framework. We believe in doing so, it will reduce data collection and reporting burden on the countries that already face resource constraints. Thirdly, to support the development and implementation of new data collection tools, including alternative data sources and new means of data collection, especially amidst COVID-19 pandemic that has uh, slowed down, if not stalled the face-to-face -face, uh, data collection due to travel restriction. Fourthly, to continue to provide capacity development through various means and ways, including through virtual trainings, to support countries in the adoption, implementation, and reporting of FAO SDG indicators. And lastly, to provide assistance in improving the analysis and use of uh, FAO SDG indicators in making decisions and policies at the national level. Um, I will stop here. Um, this was more of an introductory presentation to FAO SDG indicators. Uh, if you need more information, of course, you can always write to us using the following email addresses. For an overall overview of the 21 SDG indicators, I would suggest to you to write to the Office of the Chief Statistician, the second email address that I've given. 
for SDG2, for one related matters, please write to us uh, on, uh, on the first email address. So thank you very much. So uh, if you if you don't have any questions at this stage, then I will I will rapidly move to my my next presentation uh, on uh, on SDG two four one. Yes, please go on. We don't have any question for now. Okay. So let me just open my presentation. So Stefania, please confirm if you can see my presentation. Yes. Perfect. So this presentation, I will give you an overview of uh, SDG 241, which is defined as proportion of agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture. So before um, I start the actual training, let me walk you through the objectives of this, uh, of this particular training that we are gonna have over the course of three days. So today we will cover first and foremost, the SDG 241 methodology, its compilation and interpretation. Um, secondly, uh, to introduce the data collection tools and instruments developed for collecting and reporting data on the indicator to discuss with you concrete plans to collect data on the indicator in the short, medium, and long term. Uh, this session we will cover tomorrow. And overall aim of this training, of course, is to assemble key stakeholders uh, who are responsible for, uh, for collecting and reporting the data and those responsible for data uh, production uh, so that we ensure evidence-based policies at the national and, uh, and, and sub-national level. So as highlighted in the previous presentation, at FAO, we developed global public goods, methodology, standards, and classification in coordination, consultation, and close partnership with key stakeholders at all levels, especially countries. To give you some historical perspective, in early 2016, the FAO Strategic Program on Sustainable Agriculture and Global Strategy to Improve Agriculture and Rural Statistics joined forces to develop the pioneer methodology for the then tier three SDG indicator 2.4.1 to measure progress towards target 2.4. Now, as many of you may know, defining and measuring sustainable agriculture, which is a multi-dimensional concept is challenging as it is complex and country specific. And thus, despite several attempts in the past 50 years, since 1970s has never been done before. Um, given the multidimensionality of a sustainability concept, FEO initiated a global discussion to deliberate the fundamental uh, questions. Uh, that is, what sustainability means in the context of agriculture? What are its fundamental building blocks? What are the economic, social, and environmental factors that affect uh, and are in turn affected by sustainability in agriculture? What thematic aspects to keep as part of the framework of SDG 241 and what to let go of? How to strike a balance between the different sustainability issues faced by different regions and countries? How it will be measured and monitored consistently over time using a framework and data collection tools that are applicable and universal globally? So as you will find out in the, in the course of this training, the methodology of SDG 241 has been designed in a very simple way. It involves simple arithmetic rules to arrive at sustainability assessment of the country once the data has been collected, cleaned, processed, uh, and analyzed. Uh, the approved and endorsed methodology of SDG 241 is a result of long participatory and consultative process that I mentioned earlier. It involved discussion with and contribution of thematic uh, or subject matter experts, statisticians, policy makers, and researchers from country institutions, 
both uh, national statistical offices, Ministry of uh, Agriculture, international organization, civil society, private sector, and academia on various issues. The reason behind us involving key stakeholders with diverse background was to make this indicator owned by everyone, especially countries. The current methodology of SDG 241 embodies this, this principle, that is it's universal, policy relevant, and uh, practical. The way the methodology of this multi-dimensional indicator is designed, and you will see that as we progress during this, this training, is very simple, logical, and practical. Uh, this was to ensure the sustainability of the indicator monitoring our time at a country level. Now, um, this training will be interactive. I will gradually, in a phased manner, cover different aspects of the indicator. That is the conceptual and methodological basis, its scope and coverage, the data collection and analysis uh, tools, and uh, processes developed for reporting it to FAO. I will take breaks for question, uh, if possible, and, um, and discussion throughout and try to answer the question that you may have. Uh, with this short background and expectation of active participation and constructive discussion, I will now formally begin the training. So let me go to the previous slide. SDG goal to zero hunger has five targets. The target we are interested in today is target 2.4 which is written in extensive here. As you can see, like many other SDG targets, this target is very complex one. We highlighted in red some of the key aspects that needs to be captured as we try to measure progress toward this target. Sustainability, uh, resilience, productivity, uh, production, environmental consideration, that is climate change, soil quality, etc. all in one single target. Clearly, this would require an indicator that captures these different dimensions or aspects. The indicator that was submitted to the IAEG SDG and was approved in March 2015 is proportion of agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture. This is a tier two indicator, which means that methodology of the indicator has now been approved and endorsed uh, as an international standard. Um, but however, data in general is not available or partially available at the country level. The formula that we propose to measure the indicator is very simple and straightforward. It's uh, area under productive and sustainable agriculture divided by agriculture uh, land area. So let us focus on the denominator first. The agriculture land area is a well-known and established concept um, and it is usually collected by statistical bodies in the countries and compiled internationally via a questionnaire by FAO and is disseminated through uh, FAO STAT, which is our data dissemination uh, platform. The issue is obviously with the numerator of the formula. How do we measure area under productive and sustainable agriculture? What is clear from the description of the target which uh, uh, I showed you on the previous slide, that we have to look at the sustainability across its uh, dimensions, that is economic, social, and environmental. Meaning the agriculture area under productive and sustainable agriculture um, uh, will, be, will be the area of those farms that satisfy the sustainability criteria for all the sub-indicators uh, selected across the three dimensions of, uh, of sustainability. Here are the steps that were used in the methodological development of SDG 241. We discussed and chose the scale for assessment for 241. And the choice made for 241 was to adopt a bottoms up approach, whereby we selected farm or agriculture holding uh, level uh, that, that will in turn be aggregated to national level. The second step was to determine the scope of the activities of the holding to be covered by this indicator. The choice made for 241 was to cover crops and livestock uh, activities. Then we reviewed the dimension that will be covered as part of SDG 241. And we decided to stick to the classical dimension of sustainability, that is economic, 
social and in mental. Let me let me add here that in the beginning of the process, when we when we embarked on developing the methodology of SDG two four one, we selected five dimensions that uh, included in addition to the three which I just mentioned: economic, social, and environmental. Two other dimension, which was governance and resilience. However, later during the process, it was decided to integrate resilience with economic, environmental, and social dimension, and to drop the governance dimension as we are exclusively focused on sustainability assessments at the farm level. We then zoomed inside the dimension into what we call uh, themes uh, or aspects. So in total, we have 11 themes within the framework of SDG 241. And then the sub indicators that are needed to measure progress within each theme. So in total, we have 11 sub indicators, three in the economic dimension, three in the social dimension and five in the environmental dimension. Um, then, of course, one key uh, aspect um, that we established was sustainability criteria or thresholds for each sub indicator at a farm level to classify the farm and its agriculture area um, uh, that it owns or operates uh, sustainability statuses that is to assign it red, yellow or green color, which I will explain, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in the next slides. We also discussed um, the data collection instrument or vehicle for collecting and reporting data on the country at the, uh, uh, on the indicator at a country level. Uh, we also uh, decided on the periodicity or frequency of uh, data collection and reporting the indicator that is set at three years. And finally, the modality for reporting the indicator uh, for which we develop both a dashboard, which I will show you uh, shortly where all the sub 11 sub indicators or themes are presented in one chart, uh, though separated by sustainability status and an aggregate uh, SDG 241 indicator that can be calculated directly from the, from the dashboard. The principles that were used to develop this indicator. First, the policy relevance, actionability. We wanted to make sure that every sub indicator selected as part of the SDG 2441 framework has a meaning for policymaker and thus provided uh, information based on which informed decision can be taken to improve the situation. The indicator must be easily understood, the pr primarily the reason why it is selected, and the result easily interpreted by policymakers. Um, that is, is the agriculture sustainability um, increased or decreased and why, what policy needs to be implemented to address these issues. Universality and uh, comparability are fundamental. We are in an SDG process, a universal process. Thus, we needed to make sure that the indicator is valid every year, everywhere. It must be relevant for all countries of the world, both developing and developed. Measurability and cost effectiveness were very high in our mind in trying to find the right balance between an ideal indicator and the one which can be uh, uh, measured consistently with a reasonable cost. The affordability of the indicator in terms of data collection and reporting was our top priority. And lastly, minimum cross correlation amongst the, the sub indicators. So um, for, uh, for this principle, we selected a limited set of themes and sub indicators and in doing so efforts were made to reduce cross correlation among different sub indicators. High cor uh, cross correlation means that uh, two or more sub indicator capture the, the, the same sustainability theme. In this case, I mean, of course, inclusion of one single sub indicator instead of several would be sufficient to adequately measure agriculture sustainability performances. All these choices, of course, uh, or, and decision has uh, had an impl implication for the choice of sub indicator for different dimension, the choice of sustainability criteria for each sub indicator, and the level of sophistication in data collection. 
the measurement scope because we are interested in uh, assigning agriculture area sustainability status the basic unit of uh, measurement uh, for us uh, uh, for this indicator is uh, is uh, is uh, is farm survey so so as i mentioned the basic uh, the measurement scope uh, is is uh, is uh, agriculture holdings and the agriculture area that it owns uh, and operates so naturally we resorted to farm survey as a, as a main tool for data collection now what's included as part of the scope of this indicator is um, is given in this matrix so on the left hand side you can see as to as to what aspect of production are part of the indicator scope so intensive and extensive crops and livestock production systems subsistence agriculture food and non food crops and livestock products that is tobacco or cotton um, sheep and wool crops grown for fodder or for energy purposes aquaculture to the extent it takes place within the agriculture area as a secondary activity agroforestry or trees on farm um, especially if it is grown on the agriculture land area of the holding and common land is included within the scope uh, if it is exclusively uh, managed by by the farm holding what is out of scope is of course common land not exclusively managed by the agriculture holding nomadic pastoralism production from uh, gardens backyards and hobby farms food harvested from from the wild holding focused exclusively on aquaculture or agroforestry and lastly forest and other wooded lands the periodicity or reporting frequency of the indicator is uh, set at 3 years uh, sdg 241 measure progress toward more productive and sustainable agriculture and countries are already collecting and reporting data on several of the indicator selected as part of the framework of 241 um, so for many of the sub indicator that we have uh, uh, selected, it is unlikely that the values uh, of these indicators would change from one year to another. So a three year data collection and reporting will enable countries to have at least three data points on the indicator before 2030 to make a trend to assess their performance over time and across countries. And of course, uh, it will uh, reduce uh, data collection and reporting burden on the countries. Um, now, the SDG 241, as I already mentioned, is designed to be collected through farm surveys and the result expressed as a national value. However, the methodology is scale independent and can be adopted at uh, any geographical level. Though any introduction or our adoption of other stratification variables will have implication for the sample size and thus the cost of data collection. So to further enrich the analysis for national policy making, the indicator can be disaggregated at, uh, at a subnational level according to the types of farms, that is household, non-household, type of production activities, crops, livestock mixed, and whether the agriculture holding is using water to irrigate uh, its agriculture area. Um, other stratification variables uh, could also include the size of the farm or the gender of the, of the owner or the holder of the agriculture holding. <laughs> now, as mentioned earlier, the indicator is a multi-dimensional indicator. This slide presents a table or a matrix that includes everything that we need to know about this indicator. Toward the extreme left, you can see the indicator cut across the three dimension of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental. Within each dimension, we have a theme. Uh, for instance, as you can see, uh, within the economic dimension, we have three themes or aspects and corresponding three sub indicators that are used to measure the progress within each theme and thus uh, in the dimension as a whole. Likewise, we have five themes in the environmental dimension and three in the social dimension. 
In total, we have 11 themes and 11 sub-indicators. Too much progress uh, towards uh, in uh, those themes. The decision was, of course, in relation to measurability and cost effectiveness. The list of issues, themes, and the sub-indicators to measure and monitor sustainability is much longer that could be captured. Um, but there was a feeling that capturing 11 in total would be a very good step forward um, uh, to measure sustainability at a country level. Um, one more important point that I would, uh, we would cover, of course, in detail in my next presentation, that not all these 11 sub-indicators are applicable to all kinds of uh, farm types. So for instance, the, the sub-indicator nine and 10 within the social dimension, um, the wage rate in agriculture is applicable only to farms hiring unskilled labor while the food insecurity experience scale or FIAS is applicable only to household farms. Another consideration that I would like uh, uh, to take note of is that the reference period for data collection of, for all the indicators is not the same. So for instance, in the economic dimension, uh, the net farm income sub indicator has a three years uh, reference period. Uh, and so is the case with the sub indicator four and five, uh, which is prevalence of soil degradation and the variation in water availability that has a three years uh, reference period and as well FIAS, uh, which has a reference period of the, of the, last, um, of the last 12 uh, months. Now, as I said earlier, and on the previous slide, the hardest choice was to limit the framework of 241 to 11 themes and sub indicators. A series of expert discussion uh, in meetings, consultation, and literature review that we carried out has shown that sustainability is so complex that in general, there is a much longer list of issues uh, that could be considered and used to capture sustainability in agriculture. In this slide, you can see some issues that are considered important, but are not captured in SDG 241. So if a country wishes, we still recommend you know, them to consider these in order to assess their agriculture sustainability at a national level, but these are not required uh, for countries to monitor in context of uh, 241. Uh, one critical aspect that we will discuss uh, in detail as part of each sub indicator was the establishment of thresholds or cutoff points uh, that will be used to assign sustainability status to each farm and the agriculture area that it owns or operates. Thresholds or sustainability criteria, um, to define it very briefly, are national policy based or international targets or science-based absolute or relative values or levels below uh, or above which each sub-indicator uh, of the farm is assigned the sustainability status. So for each sub-indicator, criteria to assess sustainability levels are developed. The concept of sustainability implies an idea of continuous progress and improvement towards better performances across all themes. While such performances can, uh, can therefore be more or less sustainable. In order to capture the, con uh, the, the concept of continuous uh, progress towards sustainability, a traffic light approach is proposed for SDG 241, in which uh, three sustainability levels are considered for each sub indicator. Green is considered as desirable, yellow is considered as, as ex acceptable, and red is uh, considered as unsustainable. Um, to elaborate further, this approach allows identification for each theme condition of critical unsustainability, that is red, conditions that can be considered ideal, uh, classified as green, and in between intermediate conditions that are considered acceptable or yellow. Um, this approach also acknowledges the trade-offs existing between sustainability dimension and, and themes and the need to find an acceptable balance between them. 
Each sub indicator is assessed at the level of the agriculture holding. The sustainability level is then associated with agricultural land area of the of the of the holding. All sub indicators for a given agriculture holding therefore uh, refers to the same agriculture area. Um, as I mentioned earlier, reporting of SCG241 can be done at various level using both a dashboard and aggregate indicator. Uh, what we require countries to report on is the dashboard and aggregate indicator at the national level. Now, what makes the dashboard approach more interesting and appealing is that it helps visualize the performance across the dimension as well as across independent themes or sub indicators separately that what makes the dashboard policy relevant and actionable. Um, now, from the same dashboard, we can we can derive the the aggregate indicator uh, SDG 241. Um, now, you know, this is an example, a fictitious or made up example, whereby, as you can see on the horizontal axis, we have the 11 um, themes or sub indicators. And on the vertical axis, we have percentage of agriculture area. Um, as you can see from this dashboard, each sub indicator is color coded based on the sustainability criteria or the farm performance based on uh, the, 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 the threshold uh, values. And it, it, it's very uh, visually very informative because at a single look, you can see that the most problematic aspect for this uh, country access profitability, which has uh, recorded uh, the most uh, level of unsustainability, which is uh, 40%. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, we can also derive an aggregate indicator very easily from the dashboard approach. So uh, for us to derive the, the aggregate indicator, you can see this horizontal red line, which cut across the 11 themes. And this line is set at the indicator level, which has recorded the highest uh, unsustainability level. In this case, of course, uh, it's, uh, it's profitability. And hence, once we are reporting the indicator at a national level, the overall unsustainability at the country level will be 40%. Or the value of SDG 241 at a national level will be 40%. Uh, these are the formulas uh, that, that can be used to um, basically derive the aggregate indicator. So uh, we can visualize it both ways. So we can visualize in terms of the maximum sustainable agriculture area, which is uh, basically an addition of the yellow and green. So the area acceptable and the area desirable or the maximum unsustainable area across all the, all the 11 themes. So as you can see on the previous slide, the maximum, the unsustainable area is, uh, is for uh, uh, profitability uh, sub indicator. Now, in terms of uh, um, the dashboard uh, level, we I mentioned that basically it's uh, it's very um, helpful uh, in terms of uh, policy use and interpretation. Uh, because it helps us adhere to international standards and methods and provide a structured and transparent framework. Uh, the dashboard approach helps us focus on main issues and encourage discussion on how to make it more sustainable. I'm talking about the agriculture land area across the 11 uh, themes while linking it to the policy action. And it drives the policy to focus on intervention at various, uh, at various level. Interpretation, it's very easy to interpret in terms of the extent to which agriculture, country agriculture is far from being productive and sustainable. And it's uh, very easy to identify and prioritize the area that require, uh, that require intervention. So I will, uh, I will stop here. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, I'm very happy to take those. Thank you.
we don't have so far any question in the in the chat. We leave a few seconds to the participants. Petition. Mm, it's starting, not yet. Yes, now it's working. Okay, so in the previous presentation, we learned about the conceptual and methodological basis of SDG 241, that is its scope, crops and livestock, coverage, uh, uh, themes, sub-indicators, periodicity, uh, et cetera. In this uh, uh, session, we will go through the 11 themes and sub-indicators of SDG 241 particularly focusing on the rationale for including a theme and sub-indicator within the framework, data items required to construct the respective sub-indicator, and the sustainability criteria developed to assign the farm, and its agriculture area, red, green, or yellow, to yellow statuses, which we call the traffic light approach. So as highlighted earlier, SDG 241 is defined using the simple formula, which is uh, area under productive and sustainable agriculture divided by agriculture land area. So again, let's focus uh, on the denominator uh, first, agriculture land area. It's a, as I already mentioned, it's a well-known concept um, and it's derived by adding cropland and land under uh, permanent meadows and pastures. Uh, for, for estimation of the agriculture land area, of course, we adhere to the a system of environmental economic accounting for agriculture, forestry and fisheries, and uh, World Census of Agriculture 2020 standards and classification systems. So as you can see here, we are interested in agriculture land area as defined by CIAFF. Then, uh, you know, from the land tenure perspective, uh, it's, a, it's very important uh, to take note um, uh, particularly from, from this perspective, the scope of the indicator include agricultural land area that is owned and operated or rented in or land borrowed for free occupied and common land exclusively uh, managed by the holding. Uh, the land which is owned by the holding but is rented out is, is, is out of the scope of the indicator. So it's very obvious from the chart that I'm showing you now. So uh, as you can see uh, from this chart, parcel, uh, parcel one is owned and used. So it will be included as part of the scope of the indicator. Parcel two is again owned and used. So of course, this is, this is gonna be considered for sustainability assessment of the farm. Uh, parcel four is rented in, though it's not owned by the, by the agriculture holding but it will be included in the sustainability assessment while parcel three which is owned by the holding but rented out to other um, uh, agriculture uh, farms will be considered as out of scope of the of the um, um, of the indicator one important point to note is that common land which is uh, uh, you know used by this agriculture holding is going to be included in the scope if and only if it is exclusively managed by the agriculture holding. If the agriculture holding is sharing the common land with, with other, uh, with other uh, farms, then it's not gonna be considered for sustainability assessment and that should be excluded from the agriculture land area of the farm. Now the indicator framework, um, this slide illustrates once again the framework of SDG 241. We have three dimension, which I will show you in turn, and 11 themes and 11 sub indicators. Uh, it's uh, applicability and the reference period for data collection. So, in the economic dimension, we have three themes and three sub indicators. So, the first sub indicator is farm output value per hectare, the second sub indicator is net farm income, and the third one is the risk mitigation mechanism. Likewise, in the environmental dimension, we have five sub indicators prevalence of soil degradation, variation in water availability, management of fertilizer, management of pesticides, 
and use of agrobiodiversity supportive practices. And in turn, in the social dimension, we have three sub indicators wage rate in agriculture, food insecurity experience scale, or FIES, which is also um, uh, um, an SDG indicator in its uh, own uh, um, in its own self, uh, 2.1.2, and then secure rights to uh, to land. Of course, as I mentioned to you earlier, some of the sub indicators are not applicable to all kinds of farming system. So the wage rate in agriculture that falls within the social dimension is only applicable to farm that hire unskilled laborers. And likewise, a fierce or food insecurity experience scale is applicable only to household farms. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, as part of the disaggregation recommended by SDG 241, uh, we have recommended uh, household uh, certification of results by household and non-household farms. So FIES, we believe, is not, uh, is not uh, uh, applicable to uh, non-household sector. Again, in terms of uh, the reference period for, um, for data collection or recall, for some of the sub-indicator, it's, uh, it's set at uh, three years, while for others, uh, it's still, uh, uh, we, we still consider the last calendar year. Now, before going into the details of the respective uh, sub-indicator, let me give you generic steps. Uh, these are very simple ones that will be used to estimate each sub-indicator. Now, of course, once relevant uh, qualitative information um, is collected uh, through agriculture surveys and thereafter checked, cleaned, validated and stored on computers as spreadsheets, it must be transformed into appropriate quantitative primary variables, which are in turn uh, will be used to construct the 11th sub indicator of SDG 241. A set of uh, scripts um, um, and procedures typically carried out with statistical software such as Stata or R or SPSS are applied to the survey data for constructing the primary variables that will in turn get used to construct the 11 sub indicators. So um, let's go to the first sub indicator in the economic dimension, which is farm output value per hectare. So the dimension is economic, the theme is land productivity. The coverage for this uh, indicator is all farm types and the reference period uh, of data for this indicator is last calendar year. Now, why did, we, why did we include land productivity or farm output value per hectare as part of the framework of 241? Land productivity is a measure of uh, agriculture value of outputs obtained on a given area of land for a given time period. As uh, farm, uh, at farm level, land productivity reflects the technology and production processes for the given agro agroecological conditions. In a broader sense, an increase in the level of land productivity enables higher production with reducing pressures on increasingly scarce land resources, commonly linked to de deforestation and associated losses of uh, ecosystem services and biodiversity. Now, if you remember, if you recall the target 2.4, one of the key aspects that we needed to capture as part of the target was uh, land productivity. And hence, uh, you know, we, we chose uh, this to be, this indicator to be part of the framework of 241. Um, for, for this sub indicator, we are interested in the following data items that will help us estimate the three primary variables uh, called value of output of farm, um, agriculture area of the farm, and then further categorization of the farms by, by different typologies. Once we combine the value of output of produced by the agriculture holding, um, with the agriculture land area, uh, we will uh, arrive at the farm output value of hectare for that particular holding. Now, to estimate the value of output of that particular agriculture holding, we require uh, 
we resorted or confined ourselves to five main commodities produced by the holding. So what we need basically quantities and farms and prices of five uh, main crops and its byproducts if the holding uh, primarily is produced crops. There is uh, some kind of, uh, Sifania? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to mute. Okay, perfect. So to estimate the value of output, we can find right. ourselves to five main commodities produced by the holding. Is it okay? Okay, so let me let me re recollect. So um, so so basically, we re we can find ourselves to five main commodities or five main crops and its byproducts or if it is a livestock producing uh, a holding, then five main livestock and its products produced. Or if it is a mix of both crops and livestock uh, producing a holding, then the top five uh, commodities uh, or activities that the, um, that the holding is engaged in. Now, what we require is basically for value of output, we need quantities and we need farm gate prices. So if we have these two variables, we just simply multiply these two to get at the value of output. And then of course, we, we divide it by the agricultural land area of the holding to get to the farm output value of uh, uh, per hectare. So this slide uh, gives an example of some of the crops uh, and the byproduct uh, produced by a typical agriculture holding. Of course, this list will, uh, will vary from agriculture holding to, from one agriculture holding to another and from one country to another. So this is just um, um, an indicative list of the crops uh, that, uh, that, that a given agriculture holding can produce. In terms of byproducts of the crops, of course, uh, once uh, if we are producing wheat, we can, as, as a byproduct of that particular crop, when we harvest the wheat, stock can be produced that can be sold by the, by, by the holding as well. For, for rice, we have straw and husk. For cotton, we have sticks. For sugar cane, we have tops that are usually fed to the, fed to the livestock. For maize, um, we have stock and straw, and for mustard, we have straw and so on. Um, now, this is very important. So as I mentioned to you that basically as part of the scope of SDG 241, primarily we focus on crops and livestock uh, production system. Now, having said that, we don't rule out other on-farm activities or commodities produced by the farm as secondary activities. So if, if a farm is identified as a, as a crop producer or a livestock producer, but then on the sideline, there is a small operation whereby farm is engaged in uh, some other activities. It could be um, manufacturing of uh, wine or uh, processing uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, or maybe aquaculture or agroforestry but not as a major or, or primary uh, activity, then of course we will consider those on-farm activities as part of the productivity or uh, farm output value per hectare calculations. Now, the first step for us to calculate the uh, agriculture area of the, uh, the, the farm output value of hectare of the farm is to categorize the farms by different types. Now, let me, let me again reiterate, as per recommended stratification of SDG 241, we offer or we propose or recommend to countries three variables for stratification. First is household and non-household sector. The second one as to whether this agriculture holding is a primary producer of crops, is a primary producer of livestock, or you know, this uh, agriculture holding produce a mix of both crops and livestock. And the third um, um, stratification variable is as to whether this agriculture holding uses water to irrigate its uh, uh, agriculture area. So based on these three stratification variable, 
uh, once we combine this, the, the three um, um, uh, criteria, we arrive at 12 uh, combinations of, uh, of an agriculture holding. So it could either be a household farm producing crops and it can be irrigated, or it can be a household farm producing only livestock and it can be non-irrigated and so on. So based on these com com combinations and permutations, we arrive at uh, um, a total of 12 groups. Of course, not all these 12 groups will be um, uh, relevant in, in for, for, for a given country. But then again, I mean, it's, it's, we, we recommend countries to go to this uh, level of uh, precision for them to have uh, um, a proper understanding as to what is going on uh, in terms of uh, sustainability issues related to land productivity um, uh, in, 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 in their country. So as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, in order to estimate the farm output value per hectare, we, are, we, we need two uh, basically variables. One is farm output value, which is a multiplication of quantity of the respective commodity produced multiplied by the respective farm gate prices. And then we have to divide it by the agriculture land area of the farm. And we do, that, we do this exercise separately for each category of farm. The reason being that the productivity of a household farm which is irrigated and producing crop may be entirely different from, um, from a non-household livestock uh, sector uh, uh, agriculture holding that is using highly sophisticated technology to 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 uh, uh, to raise livestock to to raise and produce livestock. So, in order for us to compare the productivities of the um, agriculture holding with similar kind of farms, we have to uh, categorize uh, you know the agriculture holding accordingly by these different categories. Um, now, categorization into different, uh, 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 you know, um, categorization of agriculture farms by different, uh, you know, typologies would mean a rich sample size. And of course, that translates into, uh, you know, more costly data collection because you, you need to have more agriculture holding as part of your sample so that you have a representative of statistically significant estimates. So as I mentioned to you earlier, farm output value is very easily, uh, you know, can be estimated quantity into prices. So this is basically the, an example from, uh, uh, based on actual data that we collected in Bangladesh in um, 2000, um, early 2019. So we have quantity of rice multiplied by its respective farm get price to arrive at the total farm output value. Now, once we have this, Another important step in calculation of the farm output value per hectare indicator is to basically um, uh, arrange the farms, right? Arrange the farms from lowest to highest in terms of their productivity per each category, okay? And then we will, we will uh, have to derive the 90th percentile. Now, as you can see in this chart, I mean, we have, a, let's say, for example, we have um, a sample of 20 farms. Now, these farms are arranged in terms of its, uh, its uh, uh, farm output value per hectare. And then we do it by category. And then we identify the 90th percentile, okay, uh, within the distribution. And we select the, the productivity associated with the 90th percentile, which in our case is, uh, you know, highlighted as green in this matrix, and it's appearing to be 600. Based on this, we calculate the two third and one third of the, uh, of the 90th percentile, which estimates to be 400 and uh, 200 in this case. Now, why we, why we need to uh, first derive the 90th percentile and then, you know, in turn have this two third and one third of the 90th percentile because of the fact that this is built into the 
sustainability criteria of this indicator. So as you can see um, uh, in, the, in the slide, <clears throat> the farm will be classified as green if the farm output value per hectare is equal to or greater than the value corresponding to the two third of the 90th percentile estimated for the distribution uh, of categories of farm to which this farm belongs. So we have estimated the farm output value per hectare for a given farm. Then we take the distribution of the farms to which this farm belongs. We arrange the farm's productivities from lowest to highest. We calculate the 90th percentile. From the 90th percentile, we calculate the two third and one third uh, 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 ratios. And based on that, then we start comparing the, this particular farm productivity with the uh, two third and one third threshold that we estimated from the distribution. So if the farm output value per hectare is greater than two thirds, we highlight it as green. If the farm output value per hectare is between one third and two third of the 90th percentile value, then we highlight it as yellow. And if the farm output value is less than one third of the 90th percentile, then we um, uh, classify it as red. Now to give you an example. So this is again, uh, actual data from, uh, from Bangladesh. So, uh, as you can see, we have classified the farms by different categories. And for each category, in total, I mentioned to you, we have 12. So for each category, we have uh, a sample of farms. And then based on uh, you know, the, uh, the, the steps that I just explained to you, we calculated the 90th percentile, which for category one appears to be 600. So based on the 600, the two third is 400 and the one third is 200 and, and so on. For the next category, livestock household irrigated, the 90th percentile was uh, 800. Uh, the two third is 533 and the one third is 267 and so on. So we, we need to derive it for, uh, for, for the respective categories. And then as you can see, you know, from the data for the holding number one, uh, in our in our sample, uh, which we have from Bangladesh, the land productivity is estimated for this particular holding to be 900. Now this particular holding belongs to crop household irrigated sector. The 90th percentile, which I showed you earlier, that we have estimated from the distribution for this particular category is 600. So we compare the 900 with the uh, with the two third and the one third. Um, um, uh, of the 90th percentiles. And then, you know, as you can see, 900 is greater than uh, two thirds. So basically we classify this farm as green. Likewise, uh, for uh, agriculture holding um, number two, the land productivity is estimated to be 300 and it falls between the 533 and 267. So it is highlighted as, uh, or classified as yellow. And then the third one, which is, uh, has a productivity of 200, um, it falls below the one third percentile. Uh, so it is high, you know, classified as, uh, as red. So this is, this is how we, we, we estimate uh, the uh, farm output value per hectare and uh, you know, assign sustainability statuses to the farm and the agriculture area that it's on and own and operate. Of course, once we have the green, yellow, and reds identified for, uh, for all the farms, we start adding up the agriculture areas by respective uh, colors. And then we divide it by the total agriculture area of the country estimated from the, from the agriculture survey to arrive at the proportion of uh, agriculture area uh, for, for this, uh, this sub-indicator by, by traffic light approach. So if you have any questions, because this is the a bit tricky uh, indicator, uh, rest all are very straightforward. If you have a, any question regarding this one, I'm happy to take a uh, question now. Let me quickly go to the, the, the second uh, sub indicator within the economic dimension, uh, because we still have to cover 10 and uh, I, I'm not sure as to whether we will be able to finish it up, uh, you know, uh, 
today, but, but let's, uh, let's try. So an important part of sustainability in agriculture is its economic viability of the farm, uh, which is driven to larger extent by its uh, profitability. In the context of 241, profitability is measured using the net farm uh, income uh, that the farmer is able to earn from farming operations. Uh, now availability and use of information on the farm economic performances measured using profitability will support better decisions making both uh, uh, decision making both at the micro and macro levels. Um, and since performance measures uh, drive behavior, better information on performance can alter behavior and decision making by government and producer both in the large scale commercial farming and medium and small scale subsistence agriculture. So um, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, for this indicator, the reference period is uh, three calendar years, which uh, I will uh, explain to you why in the, in the coming slides. Uh, Stefania, can you see my slides sh changing? No. Okay, let me just, okay, now? Yeah. Okay. So uh, for, for estimation of this particular uh, sub-indicator, we, we propose two options. Uh, two options or approaches to countries on how to report on this sub-indicator. A sophisticated approach, which we recommend, and a simpler approach, uh, which is based on uh, farmer declaration of its profit. Now, the sophisticated approach, uh, the, the net farm income is calculated using the formula, uh, and NFI is net farm income. Um, and then the respective variables uh, included in this formula are, uh, are uh, described below. So you can see uh, CR is uh, total farm cash receipts, uh, including direct program payments. YK is income in kind. OE is total operating expenses after rebates, including cost of labor. Uh, DEP is depreciation. And um, um, Delta INV is value of inventory change. Uh, the sophisticated approach is adopted from Statistics uh, Canada. Uh, and is recommended. Uh, however, its use by the country is made conditional if data on farm financial records that are documented or recorded daily, weekly, or on monthly basis are available. In general, large-scale commercial farms maintain detailed financial records using which the net farm income can be, can be calculated. Now, for net farm income, uh, what we need is value of output, of course, uh, again, quantity uh, and the farm gate prices of uh, crops, livestock, or other on-farm activities or products produced uh, by the holding. Um, um, and then we need uh, information on direct program payments. We need information on income in kind, and uh, we need uh, value of inventory change. On the cost side, we uh, take into account both operating and fixed cost as well as depreciation. The operating expenses includes uh, laboring expenses, which is uh, cash wages or in-kind wages, fertilizer expenses, pesticide, fuel, electricity, feed, uh, irrigation costs, taxes, um, depreciation, which I already mentioned and others. So more information on how to use this approach uh, is given in the link below. It's um, um, published by Statistics Canada to estimate the net farm income. Um, then we are, as I mentioned to you earlier, we are also offering a simplified option. Uh, this simplified option can be used in, uh, it's a two tiered option. So the first simplified option is if detailed data are not available at the farm level. Uh, this is an approach which is better adopted to small holders and uh, household sector. So what we need information on again is 
quantity of output and farm gate prices of uh, crops, livestock, its products and byproducts, whether it's marketed or self-consumed. Operating uh, expenses, including input quantity and its market prices, which could be fertilizer, pesticides, uh, labor, et cetera, which I explained on the previous slide. Output quantity and farm gate prices of uh, other on farm activities carried out on the holding. Like say, for example, I exemplified that primarily as for 241, we are focused on crops and livestock production systems. But if there are other secondary activities practiced by uh, the farm, then those needs to be included in the profitability and land productivity uh, indicators. And of course, input quantities and prices utilizing the production of uh, uh, other on farm outputs. Now for this uh, uh, simplified option one, we exclude depreciation and value of inventory chain change. I mean, from experience and from data that we have uh, received uh, from countries, usually this information is not captured by the small uh, scale food producers or small subsistence agriculture production systems. Now, the second simplified option, which is which is uh, which we tested in Bangladesh as well, is basically we ask the respondent or the you know the person whom we are interviewing or administering the agriculture survey to to declare on the farm uh, on on the farm or agriculture holding profitability uh, over the last three calendar years. So uh, this simplified option is used in case of uh, SDG uh, indicator 2.4.1 uh, survey questionnaire as well that I will show you tomorrow. So in terms of the thresholds to assign the traffic light, uh, traffic light uh, uh, to, the, to the farm and agriculture area that it uh, own, manages and operates. Again, we have uh, three colors. Green is desirable, yellow is acceptable, and red is unsustainable. So if the farm profitability of the agricultural holding profitability is above zero for, for all three consecutive, past three consecutive years, then we will classify that farm as, uh, as green. Um, if the farm profitability is above zero for at least one of the past three consecutive years, then we classify it as yellow. And if the farm profitability is uh, below zero for all the past three consecutive years, it's, um, it's uh, classified as red. Um, as you may have noticed, the threshold for this indicator is set using three years data. And hence, you know, when, when on, the, on the very first slide, when I was telling you that we are using three year recall period for this indicator, this is the reason why. Um, this is to make proper assessment of the farm profitability over an extended period to account for a bad year due to market failure, such as uh, low prices of outputs in a certain year, or negative environmental or ecological factors that may have impacted uh, that may have impacted negatively the farm profitability, such as uh, heavy or untimely rains, floods, pest attacks, etc. So to account for um, to account for that, I mean, instead of one year, we are using uh, a three year recall period. So again, based on the example of Bangladesh, this is again, uh, you know, table based on actual data that we collected from uh, uh, 420 household and non household agriculture farms in Bangladesh in 2019. The first agriculture holding was profitable for two out of three years, hence we classify it as yellow. The second agriculture holding was profitable for uh, three out of three years, hence it is classified as desirable or green. And the holding number 181 was unprofitable in all three years and hence it is unsustainable based on the net farm income sub indicator. Now again, as a, as a last step, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, we aggregate the green, yellows, and red respectively. And then, you know, we divide it by the agricultural land area uh, of, the, of the country based on the um, nationally representative sample that we have selected for the survey to arrive at the proportion. So in this case, 
47% of the holding that we interviewed uh, that was selected as part of the sample, 47% of the area at the national or, 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 or for that particular sample was uh, classified as green, 49% was classified as yellow, and 4% was uh, classified as, uh, as, uh, as red. So if you have any question related to this uh, indicator, I can stay here a bit, otherwise I move on to the next one. Okay, we have a question from uh, Ratna from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So in this survey, do we make this survey as a panel survey or we take samples every survey period? Not necessarily. So as long as your sample is nationally representative, you can you can still have uh, you know you can still select other agriculture holding as part of the a part of your sample. So it not necessarily be a panel survey. It can be a randomly selected agriculture household every single time, uh, different ones. But you know it's obviously a panel survey would be good because you can track and monitor performance of the same farms over an extended time period for you to say as to whether agriculture sustainability is improving or it's decreasing uh, you know uh, over time uh, for for these particular farms so uh, it could be it could be a mix of both it could be you know you can select a certain portion of your sample to be to be fixed and then you know you you randomize uh, you know the rest of the um, the part of the sample uh, every every three years. So it 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 is entirely dependent on the country, uh, but obviously a, a hybrid approach whereby you have a panel survey whereby you keep on rotating the the panel farms which has been fixed every maybe three years. Uh, 40% share can be changed every three years, while the rest of the of the of the portion of the sample can remain the same. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Mr. Kadarmanto from Indonesia as well. So he's asking if uh, this uh, net uh, from income indicator, so indicator, is collected every year to determine the sustainable criteria. No, no, uh, it can be, it can be depending on the approach that country is using. So let's say, for example, if uh, as part of your agriculture survey system, you are collecting information every year, both on the revenues, right, or, uh, and on the cost of the agriculture holdings, then you can readily have this indicator estimated every year, okay. If not, then we recommend countries to collect information on the on on this indicator every three years. So, uh, you know, it's it's entirely it's going to be dependent on the country. But for us, um, at least every three years, uh, you know, this uh, information needs to be collected. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we are offering two approaches. One is basically a more sophisticated approach, whereby you need to have uh, data items and variable collected both for revenues and for the costs every year to have a very precise estimate of the profitability. The second option that we are recommending to countries because it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, very, it's not very data demanding is to ask the farmer as to whether he was profitable in the last three consecutive years. And based on his answer, we can, uh, we can uh, basically uh, make an, a sustainability assessment. But of course, I mean, the first approach is preferred one. And for that, I mean, if a uh, country is regularly collecting information, then they can, they can readily estimate the value of the indicator every year, and then based on that, make a judgment. But then in that case, I mean, let me, let me again uh, expand on this. In that case, you need to have a panel survey because you need to, have, you need to ask the same agriculture holding every year as to whether he was you know, profitable in year X, in year Y, and in year Z. Okay, we have another question from Mrs. Bata from, Neta, from Nepal. Is net farmer income considered the labor cost of same household farmer? Uh, come again, sorry. Is net farm income considered the labor cost of same household farmer? Um, 
Yes and no. I mean, like say, for example, for small scale, very small scale food producers, I mean, the cost of the family labor won't be considered as part of the cost of the holding because uh, that will be automatically, uh, uh, you know, usually the norm is to consider that as a revenue. Okay. But if it is a large scale commercial holding, then of course, uh, I mean, if the family labor is contributing to that, um, then it should be subtracted from the from the revenues for us to estimate the profitability. But usually, I mean, in case of small scale uh, food producers, the cost of the labor is not deducted from the revenues of the of the agriculture holding, though it should be. Okay, we don't have any question. Okay, so let me go to, yeah, to the last. Yeah, yeah, so let me go to the third and the final sub indicator in the economic dimension. It is called risk mitigation mechanisms. So, as um, you know, resilience has emerged as a key factor in sustainability, and it encompasses absorptive, anticipatory, and adoptive capacities, and refer to the processes properties of the system that allows farms to deal with external shocks and stresses. Um, in order for it to persist and to continue to be well functioning. Now, in context of 241, um, um, the following uh, external shocks are considered. So, drought, which is a prolonged period of abnormal low rainfall leading to shortage of water, flood, uh, an overflow of large water uh, uh, um, beyond its normal limits, especially uh, or what is normally dry land. Pests, a destructive insect or other animal that attack crops, food, livestock. And market shock, any demand or supply shocks that alter the price uh, uh, mismatching uh, the equilibrium in the market. So in case of risk mitigation mechanisms, we have opted for um, three shock coping or mitigation strategies in order for the farm to be considered as sustainable. So the first one is as to whether the agriculture holding uh, has access to uh, or availed insurance, which is a preventive protection measure to protect the holding against external shocks, as to whether the holding has access to or availed uh, credit, uh, which may have been obtained from formal or informal sources, such as banks, relatives, or local uh, money lenders. And the fact if the farm is uh, diversified, um, let's say, for example, if the share of a single agriculture commodities, commodity produced by the holding um, is, is greater than or, or, or less than 66% of the uh, total value of production of the holding. Now, Based on this uh, access to or uh, as to whether the holding has a weight, these three shock coping mechanisms, we assign the green, yellow, and red statuses to the agriculture holding. Now, in terms of the last uh, um, uh, coping strategy or co mitigation strategy, which is on-farm diversification, it captures the share of the value of production production of one single agriculture commodity over the total value of production of the agriculture holding, which I, which I uh, mentioned in the, on, the, on the previous slide. The formula is very simple. We take the value of production of commodity, let's say, for example, a farm is producing five commodities. So we take the value of production of commodity A and, and we divide it by the total value of production. And then we try to estimate, uh, you know, as to whether the, the value of production um, of this commodity is greater than, you know, 66% of the total value of production of the holding. So if it is greater than the 66%, we consider the farm to be non-diversified. If the value of this formula is less than 66%, we consider the farm as, uh, as, as diversified. Now, of course, as part of the 241 methodology, a farm holding is considered resilient if it has a weld or excess uh, uh, has means to access the risk mitigation mechanism as follows. So if the farm has access to or availed at least two of the three risk mitigation mechanisms, uh, credit, insurance, and diversification, 
then we consider it as green. If it has access to one of the three um, mitigation mechanisms, then it is considered as yellow. Or if it has no access to the mitigation mechanisms, then it is uh, uh, classified as red. The reason is all very simple. Um, you know, basically, if you don't have access to credit in case of external shock, or if you don't, if you are not insured in case of internal shock, and if you are not diversified, then of course, I mean, uh, your agriculture operations may not be sustainable given the external factor. So um, at least uh, the farm should have one of these uh, three coping mechanisms for it to be uh, classified as uh, sustainable, uh, acceptable, or unsustainable based on 241 methodology. Now, this is again example from uh, the Bangladesh uh, test uh, data or pilot study. So as you can see in the table, you know, uh, for household uh, holding, holding one, um, the share of one commodity was 76%. So this is above 66%. Uh, the threshold that we have selected based on um, international standard industrial classification revision four, which is 66%. So um, based on that classification, if the, if the agriculture holding uh, has a commodity um, uh, with share above 66% in its total value of addition, we classify that farm as, uh, as, uh, as non-diversified. So given that, the share of a single commodity is 76%. It's classified, uh, you know, based on this, it will be, it will be zero. Zero means uh, no, um, and, 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 and so on. So based on, uh, for on farm diversification, this farm is non-diversified. Access to credit, yes. Access to insurance, yes. Out of three, the farm has two coping mechanism or mitigation mechanism. Hence, it is uh, classified as desirable or green. The farm too, it is very well diversified because its uh, revenue is spread across three commodities, but it doesn't have any access to credit and insurance. Um, so it is uh, considered as acceptable. And the third farm is, is not diversified as well. It doesn't have any access to credit and insurance and hence it is labeled or classified as, as non-sustainable or red. Again, the last step is for us to aggregate the areas classified as green, yellow, and red, and divide it by the total agriculture area uh, uh, estimated from the nationally representative sample to calculate the proportion of agriculture area at a national level as to whether it's green, yellow, or red. So I stop here. So let me start the... First indicator, the environmental uh, dimension, which is the second dimension within the 241 framework, prevalence of soil degradation. Of course, the dimension is uh, environmental, which I just told you about. The theme is soil health. The coverage for this indicator is all farm types, so whether household or non-household, or whether irrigated or non-irrigated, or crops, livestock, or mixed. And the, 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 the reference period for this particular indicator is last three calendar years. And again, I will explain as to you why we have uh, uh, set the reference period uh, for, for three years. So um, FAO and Intergovernmental Technical Panel on Soils have identified 10 main threats to soil health. So soil erosion, soil organic carbon loss, nutrient imbalance, acidification, contamination, water logging, compaction, soil sealing, salinization, and loss of biodiversity. Um, and in the context of 241, uh, after a careful review of the 10 threats to soil health, which I just spoke about, uh, shows that all, but except one, which is soil sealing, um, which is loss of uh, natural soil to construction and urbanization, are potentially and primarily affected by inappropriate agriculture practices. In the context of 241, uh, amongst the 10, we have selected four main threats to soil health that are universal um, across, the, across the globe. So these are uh, soil erosion, um, reduction in soil fertility, water logging, and uh, salinization of uh, irrigated land. Um, 
Now, in the context of a sub indicator, to, uh, uh, in the context of this sub indicator, a simple question is asked in farm survey, which we have designed for 241. We will, we will show that to you tomorrow to capture farm, farmers knowledge or declaration about the situation of the agriculture holding in terms of its soil degradation or soil health. Having said that, ideally all, all soils under agriculture land area in a country should be subject of periodic monitoring in order to assess the impact of agriculture on soils. Now, um, the farm survey is not an ideal tool or the farmer declaration about the soil health of, uh, of, of his holding may not be the ideal way to collect information on this sub-indicator. Typically, the other more objective and robust data collection instruments for this sub-indicator are maps, uh, soil sampling, laboratory analysis, field surveys, um, or any other existing reports, uh, detailed reports on soil and land deg degradation at a national level. However, uh, you know, once we started working on the on this sub indicator, we rapidly uh, realized that uh, these other data sources, though very objective in terms of providing information on the soil health, uh, are very costly. Um, but we still uh, recommend to countries if these sources exist then these should be used in combination with the farm survey uh, to complement the information collected through these uh, agriculture surveys or to cross check the farmer responses to the questions that we have uh, that we have uh, drafted uh, to uh, um, um, to measure this indicator or, or this sub indicator and now i mentioned to you uh, you know uh, Earlier, as part of this indicator, we are focusing on four main issues to soil, uh, but we are not uh, basically uh, um, enforcing these four issues on all countries, right? So it's soil erosion, reduction in soil fertility, salinization of irrigated land, and water logging. So if there are other issues, uh, you know, apart from these, uh, you know, uh, at a country level in, 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 in some regions, then they can swap one of these for the issues that uh, the country is basically facing. So um, um, we have uh, given uh, flexibility to countries to select either these four or maybe an, another one uh, by dropping one of these uh, and, and selecting another one, which is more relevant to them. So in, in case of uh, sustainability criteria, um, now we have uh, basically, um, again, uh, we have to classify the farm and its agriculture area that it own, manages or operates by traffic light approach, green, yellow, and red. So the criteria that or, sustain, or, or threshold that we have selected for this sub indicator after discussing it with the relevant expert are the farm will be classified as green if the combined area affected uh, by any of these four selected threats to soil health is less than 10% of the total agriculture area of the farm. So if one or more than one problem exists at the farm level and it's combined, um, the combined area affected by one or more, more of these threats is, uh, is less than 10% of the total agriculture area of the farm, then it's classified as green. If the combined area affected by the four threats to soil health is between 10 to 50% of the total agriculture area of the farm, then it's classified as yellow. And if the combined area affected by any of the four selected threats uh, to soil health is above 50% of the uh, total agriculture area of the farm, then it's highlighted as, as red. Now, again, uh, the uh, Bangladeshi example. So we we ask them these uh, uh, questions, which I will show you tomorrow. So you know, let's concentrate on the first agriculture holding zero zero one. So they said we don't have any soil erosion. Yes, I have reduction in soil fertility. You know, uh, water logging. Yes, it's a it's an issue for me. Salinization. No, I don't have any issues with that. Now. 
as part of the questions we are asking as to how much area is affected by, by this particular threat. So in this case, the total agriculture area of the holding is 0.9 hectares. And the total area effective is 0 0.40. And we mentioned in the sustainability criteria, if it is the, the combined area affected of the holding is between 10 to 50%, then it's classified as, as yellow. And in this case, it's 45%. Uh, 40 divided by 90. So this agriculture farm or the agriculture area that it owns or operate is classified as yellow. Now holding three, they mentioned we don't have any problem as for our agriculture area is concerned. The total agriculture area of the holding is uh, 0.2 hectares. None of the area is, is, is affected. Hence it is considered as desirable because less than 10% of the area is impacted. Um, another uh, holding, uh, they mentioned soil erosion, reduction in soil fertility, and they said that we don't have any water logging or salinization issue. The total area of the holding is 0.27 hectares, which is captured by the questions that we ask within the agriculture survey. Um, and the agriculture area affected, in this case, it's, uh, it's estimated to be 74%, and hence it is considered as non-sustainable because more than 50% of the agriculture area of the uh, farm is, uh, is considered uh, as, uh, as unsustainable or is considered as affected and hence uh, is more than 50%, so it's, it's not sustainable. So again, the last step, you know, basically we aggregate the areas classified as green, yellow, and red, and divide the respective areas by national rep nationally representative agriculture land area of the, of the, of the country, derived uh, from, the, from the nationally representative uh, uh, sample or ag agriculture survey, and then thus we, we derive these proportions. Mention is variation in water availability. Um, the coverage is, of course, uh, all farm types. The theme is water use. The reference period is last calendar year. Now, in agriculture, more specifically, irrigated agriculture is by far the main economic sector using fresh water resources. In many places of the world, water withdrawal from rivers and groundwater aquifers is beyond what can be considered environmentally sustainable which affects both rivers and underground aquifers. Sustainable agriculture therefore require that the level of uh, use of fresh water for irrigation remains within acceptable uh, boundaries. Now, um, in terms of, in terms of uh, this particular um, sub-indicator, the way we have designed the threshold, is to, you know, uh, th there are multiple assessment criteria. So let's say, for example, if a farm is not irrigating uh, or, uh, or, or, uh, or is irrigating less than 10% of its agriculture area, right? So if a farm is irrigating less than 10% of its agriculture area, it will be automatically considered as sustainable or green or if the water availability remains stable over the years for farm irrigating crops on more than 10% of, of its area, okay? So here visualize this issue in terms of impact of agriculture on the, on the environment, okay? If a farm is not using water, then it's not contributing to the environmental issue and hence it is classified as green. If the farm is, you know, basically using water, but the water availability is stable, um, then, you know, it, it will be considered as green. For yellow, we say that um, farm uses water to irrigate crops on at least or more than 10% of its agriculture area, but it doesn't know as to whether water availability uh, remains stable over the years or experience reduction on water availability of the years, but there is an organization that effectively allocate waters among the users. So a farm is basically using mo water more than 10% of its agriculture area. It's observing, you know, reduction in water, but then there are local organizations 
um, which uh, uh, which uh, uh, which are mandated to ensure the delivery of water to different users according to established rules. So basically, if this organization uh, exists, these can be public, owned by farmers or private operators. Then we we say that you know we will classify this farm as yellow. And and red in all other cases. By this, I, I mean to say that if farm uses more than ten percent of its ag agriculture area for irrigation, um, the water level is going down, and as well there are no organization to effectively manage or allocate the water amongst the user, then it will be classified as red. Now, uh, again, in terms of uh, Bangladesh example, uh, um, you know, the first holding replied, no water is always available in sufficient quantity. We highlighted it as, uh, um, as desirable, okay. Uh, though it's uh, irrigating more than 10% of, uh, 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 of its agriculture area with water. Holding to say, yes, water level in my wells is progressively going down, but I have organization, uh, you know, in my area that are working very well. So it's irrigating more than 71% area, um, but, you know, though water availability is going down, there are organization, hence it is, uh, classified as acceptable. Um, and then, you know, the holding number 36 replied that, yes, water level in my wells is progressively going down, but there are no organization and yet to allocate water and yet, you know, it's uh, irrigating more than its 74% area. So this, uh, this agriculture holding in terms of variation of water availability is classified as uh, as unsustainable. Um, now, the in terms of sources of irrigation, it could either be canals, it could be a river, it could be a lake, or it could be a, a tube well or open well. So we are considering all sources of uh, of uh, of irrigation. So in terms of again, I mean the last step is exactly similar for 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 the rest. So we uh, add up the agriculture areas classified as green um, uh, and then as you know classified as yellow and red and then we divide it by nationally representative agriculture area and uh, we calculate the proportions. Sure, uh, thank you very much uh, colleagues. Uh, I mean uh, it was uh, very nice to interact with you. And uh, please don't hesitate to write to us any questions that you may have, you know, in an email, uh, you know, tomorrow, just note down it with you. If something is unclear, I can clarify it further. And, uh, you know, Stefania, you may want to say something. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so thanks uh, from my side as well. We are going also uh, to share uh, an email with you, or maybe if you want to mention this stock taking, uh, this Yes. So, yes. so, so basically, colleagues, I mean, um, hopefully today, I mean, we are going to send you a stock taking uh, questionnaire. So what, what this question is about is basically we have mentioned in this questionnaire all the data items that will help us calculate the primary variables for, uh, for constructing the respective 11 sub indicators. Now, given that we have only covered the economic dimension and, um, and half of environmental dimension, uh, we don't expect you to basically uh, fill in the entire questionnaire for tomorrow. But we expect you to send us this questionnaire filled in by the end of this training so that we know to what extent the current data collection uh, at the country level or the current data that exists at the country level enables you to report on 241. So it will give us a very, very clear understanding to what extent the countries are ready to report on the 11 sub indicators. Maybe some countries will be able to report on one, others may be able to report on three, but that's a very good uh, information for us.
So we will share that with you today. And then we expect you to send this back to us on uh, hopefully on Friday. Okay, thank you. So perfect. So uh, we know that uh, today's session maybe was a little bit uh, uh, hard to follow because it's a lot of uh, information. So really thanks everyone for being connected all the time. And uh, please tomorrow, as we said, 30 minutes in advance, so 7.30 a.m. GMT time. And as Aspandaya said, if you have questions, also use uh, our email address, no problem. We will uh, check it and in case we we'll reply for tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Okay. So thank you everybody and uh, see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.